right, so for our first talk today, I'm going to call Dr. Chad up on the stage. Uh, we are going to be looking at U.S. Iranian nuclear negotiations. And uh, we're going to do something differently here. We're doing a joint tip talk. First time we've ever done this. Uh, we realized that for certain topics, one political scientist isn't enough. For most things, one political scientist is more than enough. <laughs> if you ever, if you ever throw a party and you're looking through your list of guests and you see a lot of political scientists on the list, run, run. it's probably not going to be a good party, right? So, um, Unless it's us. Like, uh, well, yeah, us uh, excluded. Present yeah. companies. Uh, that's right. But for a topic like Iran, and specifically the complexity of those negotiations. It's valuable to think about that and think about it from a domestic as well as international perspective. And that's what we're going to do today, uh, is talk about those elements. And so as we zoom out from Obama's increasingly gray hair, uh, it's important that we remember that he's got a hard job. Right? This is difficult. He's looked better. Uh, he's stressed. Right? The, the challenge of these negotiations are getting to him. And what we see is that he's pulled in two different directions. He's got domestic actors that are wanting him to do one thing. And he's also got international actors that are asking him to do different things. And so we can zoom in and look at some of these actors, right? And, uh, both these Democrats guys right here. and Republicans. And some of them are angry, right? The um, turtle. I like Mitch McConnell, the turtle. The cane is angry, right? Uh, we can switch to the international side. We've also got some, some difficult actors to deal with. So Dr. Chad and I thought this was an interesting situation, right? It creates a fun little opportunity for us to have a tip talk face off. Ah! Where we talk about uh, what's the more challenging level, international or domestic politics. Uh, and, and both of us are a little biased in terms of what that's going to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about three things pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about conservatives at home. So we all know about uh, conservatives in the American political system, but we're going to compare those to conservatives in the Iranian political system and talk about how conservatives can cause trouble for Obama. We're going to talk about the broader political context. These negotiations aren't occurring in a vacuum. Other issues matter. And so we're going to think about the domestic American political issues as well as the international issues and how those make his job all the more difficult. Finally, we're going to talk about some peripheral players. These are individuals who aren't part of the negotiations, oh, but they're causing all sorts of trouble and making this a more complex process. Right. So we're going to go back and forth. And at the end of the talk, we've got a tweet ready and loaded to have you weigh in and see who wins. Which level is the more difficult uh, level for the Obama administration, international or domestic? All right, so at this point, Dr. Chad is going to kick off by talking about conservatives at home. Oh, yes. Well, so thank you all for coming. I know, as Dr. Muck said, it's week 10 and we've got a lot going on, but um, we're super excited about this talk in particular, not just because we're doing our first joint one, but because of the other talks we have. So we want to start off talking about, as Dr. Muck said, is looking at conservatives at home. And so we start with this picture. I don't know if any of you saw this of the child throwing a tantrum in Obama's office uh, the past few weeks. But I like to think of this child as Tom Cotton, if we're familiar with Tom Cotton and who he is. So this gentleman here is Tom Cotton. He's the current senator. And he had this brilliant idea and got 47 other senators, uh, 46 other senators on board with him to draft a letter to the leaders of Iran to school them on the way our government works because clearly they're not smart to figure it out on their own. And so he thought, I'm going to write this letter, I'm going to get all these people on board with me, and we're going to talk to the leaders of Iran about what are the consequences of just negotiating with the president because of the way our constitutional system operates. So in particular, what he wants us to know, wants the leaders of Iran to know, is executive orders are not as good as a law. That if the leaders of Iran deal with the president exclusively, it's a mere executive order as opposed to going through Congress. Well, what we all know, especially my intro students here, is that an executive order has the force of law. An executive agreement in this case, even though not a treaty, has the force of law. It is not just a mere executive agreement in this case. But particularly what, what uh, Senator Cotton wants the leaders of Iran to know is that when Obama is gone, because he can't wait for that to happen, those members of Congress will still be there. And they will simply just poof get rid of the executive agreement as if it didn't exist at all. Trying to dissuade the leaders of Iran from negotiating exclusively with the president because he's very cranky, as are lots of people about President Obama. Undermining
denying the legitimacy of our president is nothing new, right? Because that's really what this letter does and what the tactic of these 47 senators was, was to undermine the legitimacy of our president and to say, don't deal with him, deal with us instead. Because he's not really a citizen. We need his long form birth certificate to show that he's really a citizen. And oh wait, in the middle of a speech, getting yelled at by a member of Congress. The undermining of our current president is not something that's new. It's something that's happened even when he was running in 2007 before he was president in 2009. But dealing with it now with the international implications as Dr. Muck will talk about is another level of undermining. It's another level of trying to say that he is somehow illegitimate, not just as a person, but as the office holder, because that's really two different things, but still important. As we talk more about this gentleman throwing a tantrum on the floor of Obama's office, he decides to take to social media because like, that's what you do, you take to social media. So he decides, if I can't get through them with this letter, I'm gonna tweet, because we all love to tweet in this room. He's gonna tweet. He sends a series of tweets to one of the leaders of Iran, calling him out for a schoolyard match. He basically says in four parts, hey, I hear you called me out today. If you're so confident, let's debate the Constitution. This is what he's saying to, um, to Zarif. Here's the offer, meet in DC. Time of your choosing to debate Iran's record of tyranny, treachery, and terror. Okay, so apparently there's gonna be like dodgeball or I'm not really sure what's happening. I understand if you decline after all. In your 20s, you had hid in the US during the Iran-Iraq war while peasants and kids were marched to die. Tried to shame him, right? And then finally saying, not a badge of courage to hide in the US while your country fought war to survive, but shows cowardly character still on display today. So trying to convince the leaders of Iran to not negotiate with Obama for constitutional reasons is one thing, but calling him a coward and challenging him to a duel, basically, not really the best strategy, I would say. But this is what Obama is contending with, right? What Zarif does when he comments back is he says, I wish you well with your newborn child. <laughs> anyway, the idea, again, is if Obama is trying to have legitimacy abroad, how can he do it if no one thinks he's legitimate at home? It's an issue. All right, well done, Dr. Chad. I see you're Tom Cotton, but I raised you an Ayatollah. I'll give you uh, that. In terms of thinking about having to deal with difficult conservatives. So in Iran, there are also, we tend to think about conservatism as just being a US thing, but that's not true. There are conservatives all over, and there's a ton of them in Iran who are very much against this agreement. And also, just like conservatives in America, they love to tweet. Uh, so the Ayatollah, the supreme leader here, he tweets all the time specifically about the negotiations, uh, talking about not trusting our negotiators and uh, the U.S. is really behind terrorism. My favorite part is that the supreme leader, he knows how to hashtag. I, that, that takes some skill. Uh, he doesn't just tweet about uh, the negotiations, he also tweets about, tweets about uh, U.S. History and US politics. So this bottom one, even abolition of slavery, hashtag, in the US wasn't uh, based on humanitarian intents, but on north south wars and conflict between landowners and industrialists. Uh, Supreme Leader's taken an intro to political science. Uh, you understand some of the history. Also, uh, he's clearly following what's going on in terms of US domestic debates, talking about issues between US police force and African American communities, talking about Mike Brown tweeting about US police kill and oppress innocent people. The result of such is behavior is insecurity, hashtag Baltimore. And in the world of deception, the most racist governments become flag bearers of human rights, hashtag US, hashtag Israel, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Now there's a couple things that are interesting in this, right? I mean, these tweets are in English, so they're intended for a Western audience. There's a clear intent here. And what we see is that conservatives in Iran are attempting to poke Obama, trying to push him, to prod him, uh, to get him to do something that might derail these negotiations. Now, some of them are against the negotiations uh, for economic reasons. So because of the sanctions, uh, they've benefited. So most of Iran has suffered because of the sanctions, uh, but they might have been able to be part of the illicit global economy. So they've, they've benefited. Uh, others for nationalistic reasons in terms of long-standing Iranian US tensions. Some for religious reasons. But nevertheless, there is this, there's this minority pocket of conservatives who have a very, very powerful voice and have the ear of the supreme leader and are arguing, we don't need this deal to go through. And they're doing everything they can to get Obama to make a misstep. 
So uh, the U.S. has ships in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and Iran, oftentimes, some of these conservatives uh, will have little tiny ships come up right around U.S. troops, just sort of like poking us with a stick, saying, do something. Cause some little minor military incident that would derail the negotiations. Or they'll funnel funds into terrorist organizations, which the United States is very much against, as a hope of creating a domestic debate. And again, all of this is trying to bait Obama into undermining the process. So conservatives, both in the United States and in Iran, are causing trouble. True. But we have to think about the broader political context, because as Dr. Muck said, none of this happens in a vacuum. So he'll talk about his, his context, but of course I think that our context is more important and definitely relevant, if nothing else. So when the president is talking about particularly the fight with Congress over who should have the authority to make this deal and to enter into these negotiations, he says very clearly, if Congress kills this deal, not based on expert analysis and without offering any reasonable alternative, then it's the United States that will be blamed for the failure of diplomacy. So what he's really trying to say is, hey, Congress, if you screw this up, the whole US is going to blame you for it. It's not, they're not, not going to blame me for it. They're going to blame you for it. If you get in the middle of this deal, and not because you have a better offer, but just because you want to undermine me and my process in this and my place in this, it's going to be your fault, and the United States is going to blame you for it. Now, this is a very important piece of rhetoric, right? Because he's trying to shift some of the blame a little bit. But that rhetoric only works if you have political capital behind it. If you have a certain level of support in your constituency, the national constituency, to say, hey, we back you on this, so we want you to move forward with this. So we look at this in three ways. The first is just general overall approval of how the president is handling his job. And we can go from when he first basically enters office all the way up through where we are now. And there's some blips here. None of that is particularly relevant to today. But what we see is that with approval and disapproval, they're pretty much neck and neck, and particularly within the margin of error. So overall, his job <laughs> approval, pretty much the same as disapproval. He's used a lot of political capital on other things to try to use it now to convince the people, I have a way to deal with Iran, and you should trust me on it and back me on it. And all this like other stuff surrounding all these Tom Cotton tantrums, we don't need to be listening to these things. It's one way to look at it. We have to dig a little bit deeper, though, to look at what do we think of his foreign policy. How do we feel like he's handling foreign policy? Now, what's particularly interesting about this time period, this is pre-talk of negotiation. This is post-talk of negotiation. As soon as this becomes public and this battle between Congress and the president becomes more public, now we're second-guessing the president's ability to handle foreign policy. While the approval is relatively the same, we see a pretty good uptick, uptick in disapproval. Um, excuse me, a down, down tick in disapproval, but a little bit up in approval. So maybe we do think he's doing a good job, but it's, a, it's still unclear because it's only this one snapshot, and now we're into June. And so what does it look like as we move towards this June 30th deadline? Of course, we don't have the polling yet because we're not at June 30th. Um, but we even have to dig a little bit deeper. What do we think about the way he's handling Iran specifically? There's three parts that are important here. The first of which is, do people agree that we should directly negotiate with Iran? Okay. Well, yeah, for the most part, we should. Somebody should be negotiating. Okay. Fine. Problem is, how serious do we think Iran is in negotiating with us? We don't have a lot of faith in that. It's okay to have faith on one side, but we don't really have faith on the other side. And so if one person, if the president, is trying to talk to leaders of Iran who we don't think are serious at all, is it just a giant colossal waste of time, right? Especially if overwhelmingly people think Congress should have the final say in any kind of deal that happens. Again, this broader political context of what do the people think the president should or shouldn't be doing, not what Congress thinks he should or shouldn't be doing. And it seems pretty clear from this that people think that Congress should have the final say. How does that affect the president's ability to make a solid, long-lasting deal? You decide. I'll concede. The American political system is messy, right? It's complicated, there's nuances. But if we looked at the Middle East recently, 
This, is, this, this, this makes the American political system look like a leisurely walk in the park, trying to understand what's going on here. I take a bit issue with the easy, leisurely part. So Iran, a lot of its neighbors are very, very interested in how these negotiations play out. And will have a say and are going to be pushing the U.S. And, and their, their local issues are going to become U.S. issues. So arguably the most delicate issue that Obama has to think about as he moves forward on these negotiations is U.S.-Israeli relations. So Israel sees Iran as an existential threat to its security and its existence. And it's been very clear that it does not want to see a deal done. It be believes that that is a wrong course of policy action. And so has pushed back on that. So every time Obama sits down at the, the negotiating table with Iran or John Kerry sits down there, they have to think about how does this affect Israel? How does this impact our relationship, our alliance with Israel, and how are they going to respond? So that's one. They also have to think about Saudi Arabia who also is very much against these negotiations. Saudi Arabia is concerned that if these negotiations lead, lead to a lifting of sanctions, suddenly Iran becomes a regional hegemon and potentially pushes Saudi Arabia out. And I don't know if you know this, but Saudi Arabia has a lot of oil. I do. And oil makes, all their oil makes US presidents do silly things. So uh, George W. Bush, former President George uh, W. Bush, you remember him, uh, he doesn't hold hands with a lot of men. He makes an exception for the king of Saudi Arabia. And so again, just like, just like dealing with Israel, Obama has to think about those, the delicate implications of working out a deal with Saudi Arabia. Syria and Iraq and ISIS playing out there. This is a whole new dynamic. How does the United States handle ISIS? Well, uh, interesting in this case, Iran and the United States are on the same side. Iran doesn't like ISIS, the United States doesn't like ISIS. And they've been helpful pushing back. But at the same time, Iran supports Syria and supports the regime there, the Assad regime, where the US would like that regime gone. So this is a political minefield where they've got to think about how do we handle this and think about all those relationships. Lots of juggling balls up in the air. And then there's one other actor, and I uh, can't, can't think of who it is, who might, might be relevant to what's going on here, and that's Vladimir Putin. Uh, who is very much part of the negotiation. So it's, uh, Russia is one of the six countries that is negotiating with Iran. And Obama has tried very, very hard to separate these two, to say, well, uh, Russia, what you're up to in Ukraine, that's over here, and we'll talk about that. And we'll say, bad, bad Russia on Ukraine. But when we talk about Iran, you know, we need you, Russia, like good Russia on Iran. And so, so they would like, Obama would like to keep those separate. Putin doesn't want to keep those separate. And anytime Obama pushes a little too hard on Ukraine, Putin gets a little difficult on Iran. So he's got to balance all of that as he's thinking about how we move forward. So he has to navigate these challenges within the region and within the entire international system. Again, very, very similar to the challenges presented by a domestic political environment. I think they should just wrestle bears, <laughs> right? And see who wins. So, okay, Putin, I'll give you Putin. I got Ted Cruz. <laughs> Mic drop, right? I got Ted Cruz. We might be aware that we're in the midst of a presidential election cycle. We just had another candidate emerge today. Rick Perry officially announced his candidacy for president. Um, lots of Republican players. We're going to talk mostly about them because what we know is that when there's a presidential election, of course, the presidential candidates are going to be talking about current policy. And one of the things that works really well for the party that's not in the White House is to bash the president right now, right? So because this is such a big deal, because everyone's talking about it, because there are international implications of this Iran deal, obviously the presidential candidates want to take a stand on it. They want to try to say to the people that might vote for them, I've got a solution. And it's not President Obama's solution. Well, we've got some strong rhetoric. So Ted Cruz, one of the first, if not the first, actually to announce his candidacy, comes out and says, this deal makes war a certainty. Now, the audience, to whom he's delivering this is important, he's talking to APAC, right? So he's talking to supporters, very staunch supporters of Israel. A lot of the rhetoric that we're hearing from the Republican candidates in particular is all about the idea that this deal ignores Israel, doesn't include the protection of Israel. In fact, there were some senators who tried to get an amendment added to the bill that was passed that explicitly said that they have to recognize the state of Israel and protect it. And the president said, we cannot include that in this deal. Very, very, very angry Republican candidates and using that rhetoric to spin it to their benefit, also to the president's detriment. 
So again, not happening in a vacuum because there's all these other peripheral players like Ted Cruz making these statements. We dig a little bit deeper to Scott Walker. Has not announced his candidacy, but basically talks like he has. Makes a statement. After this statement, he talks about Israel as well. And he says, President Obama is telling us to trust him when it comes to the Islamic Republic of Iran and to ignore its chance of death to America and its destructive role in the region. So again, this rhetoric is super interesting because he doesn't just say Iran. He says the Islamic Republic of Iran, reminding everyone, ooh, Islam bad, Muslim scary, right? Which we'll see more in the next uh, thing I'll talk about next. Ignoring the chance of death to America and the destructive role in the region. Again, invoking the idea of Israel. We gotta be worried about Israel. Iran is detrimental to Israel and nothing that we're doing is taking care of Israel. Hasn't even announced his candidacy yet. This gentleman has. <laughs> Watergate 2.0, right? He basically says, as is stated here, when he's talking about the consequences of this deal, that Iran will blow up a bomb in one of their, Iran would say this about the United States, will blow up a bomb in one of their cities, will blow up their embassies in Latin America, will kill Americans, we're going to punish them. There are a million things happening with this quote. The first thing is, he's saying if we do this, it's our fault and we're all gonna be hurt and we're gonna have major bombs going off in our cities. Okay, that's kind of a problem. Then he says, we'll blow up their embassies in Latin America. Speaking to a very specific kind of voter here, a voting block Republicans have not done well with, but Marco Rubio has an edge with, right? We'll kill Americans, we're going to punish them. The retribution, if we do this, and it's gonna be your fault for supporting it. Oh, by the way, vote for me, don't forget. We've got some other players who haven't officially announced their candidacy. Well, one has, and well, actually both have at this point. They tweet. We like to tweet here, too. Ben Carson, neurologist, neurosurgeon maybe even, I'm sorry. The main conclusion from months of negotiations is that the Iranians are superior negotiators. Sunset provisions are never a good deal. So now he's telling people, hey, Iran got the better end of the deal here. We totally screwed up. The president totally screwed up. The Democratic Party totally screwed up. So hey, vote for Republicans, for everything. Mike Huckabee, everybody's favorite, back in the mix again. Direct tweeting at Obama, because he has his own Twitter account now. Barack Obama acts with far more accommodation to the Iranians than he does the Israelis, and that makes no sense to me. Trying to paint Obama as not friendly to Israel, and the whole party, the Democratic Party, is not friendly to Israel. How can the party and the president function and try to make a deal that's good for the country if there's all these voices around him? I will concede that the Republican primary might be the best political theater out there right now. So good. But, so good. but have any of them shown up at the United Nations with a cartoon bomb talking about the destruction and danger posed by Iran? There. I give you Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> Uh, who showed up at the United Nations in New York to give this speech, essentially arguing against the agreement, saying this is dangerous. And of course, once somebody shows up, that's, that's a real picture. Once that shows up in the real world, oh, the internet has fun, right? So uh, we create all sorts of other memes of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I, li I, like, I like this one a lot. <laughs> but there's, there's a point to all this. So he gives this speech at the UN. A little while later, he shows up at the US Congress, uninvited by Obama. It was a little bit of a snub, nobody liked that, or the Obama administration didn't like that, to give a speech to Congress and give a speech to the American public in, a, in an attempt to shape the debate. So he's not doing this for an Israeli audience, he's doing this for the American audience, trying to shift our discourse, how we understand Iran and the threat posed by Iran. This is a big deal. And it makes it much, much more difficult for Obama to argue for negotiations when you have the Prime Minister of Israel arguing that it, uh, Iran is such a major, major danger. So there was a bit of a snub here by Netanyahu. That wasn't the only snub. Uh, the Arab Gulf states also snubbed Obama. Recently, he held a summit. Obama held a summit. This was going to be a great photo op. He was going to bring in all the Arab Gulf states, and they were all going to sit down, and he was going to assure them, I've got your back on Iran. Don't worry. It's going to be OK. Well, the Arab states, at least four of them in particular, weren't buying this. So the leaders decided, we're not going to show up. So the king of Saudi Arabia, uh, the sultan of, of Oman, and uh, both from Bahrain, as well as United Arab Emirates, four of them, the heads of state, don't show up. They send somebody else. 
Uh, and this was a clear message to Obama. We're not happy with what you're doing. My favorite excuse for this stuff. So uh, the king of Saudi Arabia said, uh, there's stuff going on in Yemen. I'm, I'm busy. I can't come. But uh, the king of Bahrain had the best. He was actually in London at a horse show with the queen. There are snubs, and then there are horse snubs. Uh, and this one was particularly difficult for the Obama administration to accept, right? So, and again, this was all made very, very public, and the Obama administration says, no, no, it's no big deal. But this was a signal by the Arab states saying, we're not pleased with these negotiations, and we're going to make it clear in your domestic political environment that we're not happy. Again, very, very, very difficult. All right, Dr. Chad, wrap us up. So what I think we have shown, if nothing else, is that there are two things happening here separately, but that they also infuse together to make things incredibly complicated for the president. Both things that are happening now and then the possible sort of like long-term legacy things that will happen from this deal, especially as we get close to this June 30th deadline that's looming. So while of course I think I made the most convincing argument, I guess I'll let you guys decide. So here's what we're going to do. Dr. Muck right now is doing it. I'm getting it ready. All right, we have a tweet prepared ready to go out where we're going to ask you what you think, right? If you think that it's the domestic problems or domestic politics that makes things more problematic for President Obama, then we want you to retweet this tweet from Dr. Mark. If you think that it's the international game that makes it more complicated, we want you to favorite this tweet. And the instructions are in the tweet? They're in the tweet, and the tweet right? is out. It's out. So we want to hear what you guys have to say because it matters. And we're all done. We're all done. We're all done. We're all done. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. Thank you.